Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. This podcast is brought to you by Farmhand. Farmhand is the all-in-one software platform and virtual assistant built by and for independent farmers. Through a simple text or email to Farmhand, you can instantly offload admin tasks, automate your CSA, update your website, and sell more to your customers. With zero startup costs or long-term commitments, farmers are reporting an average of six-plus hours in time savings and 20% in sales growth each week. Learn more and take the quiz to see how much you can save by partnering with Farmhand. Visit farmhand.partners forward slash podcast. That's farmhand.partners forward slash podcast to learn more. Hey guys, Michael Kilpatrick with yet another episode of the Thriving Farmer Podcast. And today my guest is Bree Bosch, who runs Blossom and Branch Farm in Colorado. On 1.7 acres in the suburbs of Denver, Bree and her husband have been blending budget-friendly farming with environmental stewardship and offering educational classes and sustainable wedding florals. Bree, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and give us a little bit of an overview of what it is like farming on 1.7 acres in the suburbs. So we have a lot of neighbors to deal with. So that's Mm. always probably our biggest, uh, you know, struggle is trying to make sure that we keep everybody happy around us, that especially with doing agritourism, that we're not stepping on anyone's property lines and being mindful of parking and all of Mm -hmm. those things. And fences are very important. Um, so we deal with, you know, definitely a different set of of struggles here mm-hmm. uh, in more of a suburban area than we would in a rural spot. So then do people just want to come visit the flowers and borrow the flowers? Is that something that you've struggled with? Um, you know, no, we, well, we've had a, a few people randomly show up at the farm, you know, outside of business hours. And that's always mm. something that we deal with. Um, but for the most part... You know, everyone is pretty respectful. We do you picks, we do uh, a mm-hmm. farm stand, and we're usually pretty clear about, you know, these are our hours. We try to limit the impact. We usually give all of our neighbors free flowers <laughs> during the yeah. season just to help keep keep the uh, keep the relationship good. So we've we've learned to strike the balance, but yeah, it, it's 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 something else to consider. You know, there's always zoning and all those other things that we have to keep an eye on. Is anything changing? in terms mm-hmm. of these restrictions that we have to deal with. So so talk a little bit about that, because that's absolutely something that's probably been our biggest thorn in the side since we started is dealing with, you no, know, you can't have your fire truck parked in your front yard because you don't have impervious surfaces underneath it. And you just need to also have a driveway to that because you're not allowed to just park it on an impervious surface by itself. It's, there's so many. Yeah, and exactly. And it's different, right, from city to city, what mm-hmm. different restrictions are. And so... We've found that it's been really helpful going to our city, uh, making good relationships with our council people, and so that we kind of have somewhat of an input in terms of, Mm -hmm. hey, here are the things as urban ag that we're struggling with. Can you help us out? And they've been really, really helpful with with being responsive to those requests and kind of having our back when those conversations do arise. Um, Luckily, they've been very few and far between, but an example is our, our sheep. So we practice regenerative ag. And so, you know, part of that is we try to incorporate some animals. And one of the things that we found when we started the farm was that our city allowed goats, but not small sheep. And yeah, like why, you know, it seems like such a, a silly differential because I mean, I don't know if you know, but small sheep, especially are so much less impactful on the landscape than goats. And, you know, goats are escape artists and, Um, The sheep are really well behaved and they're quiet and compared to goats that will both eat everything, you know, they'll eat fencing and housing, siding and whatever they can find. Um, But they're also just, they tend to get out more. So, so that was something that we, you know, we went to our council people and we we kind of told them all of this and not being in agriculture, they don't always understand that. But once we explained it, Mm -hmm. um, they were able to get us, you know, the, uh, the exception so that we were able to 
to have the sheep, but it's just little things yeah. like that where I find that having a relationship with, with our, our elected officials is really helpful. Yeah. So how many sheep do you have on the property? We only have two because we're a small okay. farm and, and really a third of it is dedicated wildlife habitat. Okay. So we kind of struggle with finding the balance of having, you know, making sure that they have enough room and be able to graze them as often as Correct. we like, but also not having them overtake all of the natives and things that we're trying to establish in that habitat area. Correct. Yeah. Cause sheep do eat food. Um, we've always wanted something a little bit larger, but cause we don't have any animals at the moment. And I've thought of, we've looked at, you know, we don't, can't do cows cause that's a little too big. Right. But I think sheep might be a good, good use and they're super cute. And because we are, we have an on-farm store. So my aspect is okay. So what is something that will attract people and is super cute and the kids will love? And because it's interesting, because moms will call us and say, "Hey, I want to come visit your farm and in your animals." And they always say animals, and I'm like, "I'm sorry, but if you kind of look at all our socials, we in our, but we don't have any animals. We grow vegetables, right? And, like, do you, you mean know, our fruit. kids? <laughs> yes." <laughs> Exactly. Yes. They are enclosed in a fence and you can watch them. <laughs> Not free range children. No. no. Um, but I have thought baby doll sheep would be super fun. Um, and they're just adorable. So, um, that's the breed that we see. have. Yeah. We yeah. have the South down baby dolls and they are very sweet. They're, they're very friendly, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they they tend to be the most mild mannered, I think of the sheep yeah. breeds. Um, they are cute. They, we've found, also the extra benefits of, you know, we use their wool a lot in our seed starting mm -hmm. now and also as mulch. Um, so, you know, we're trying to find ways to also Correct. incorporate them in different ways other than just, you know, yeah. having them because it, it does happen. I mean, in the winter we're, we're a cold climate farm. We're zone five, six. So mm, yeah. we don't graze. We can't graze all winter. It's just Correct. not feasible. Yeah. Um, so, you shape. know, in those times it's like, well, how do we make this, <laughs> you know, economically, because it is always a consideration of, of, you know, yeah. you're just feeding them all winter. We don't have enough space to grow yeah. enough, you know, for them over winter. So, um, so we're having to pay out of pocket to feed them. And so using the wool and seed starting has saved us a ton because we don't have to fertilize our seedlings, which has been. Okay. So wait funny. a minute, let's back me up a little bit there. How do you use it in seed starting? So we started doing this two years ago. We were experimenting with it. Um, okay. And we just now have kind of come to the point where we're, we've started telling people exactly the ratios that we're doing because, we, you know, it just takes fiddling with them. Yes, playing with. correct. Yeah. So we started with wool pellets. Um, so where they pelletize the wool. So any shearing usually results in seconds, which is kind yes. of the, the little bits, you know, like the cuttings and mm -hmm, there's manure mm -hmm. attached and they just can't use it for any other purpose. Typically that's discarded. Uh, it's too smelly to use for other purposes like insulation or any, any of the other kind of common wool things. Correct. So it often gets discarded. So instead there's now these wool pelletizers. So it's a machine. They feed the wool into it. It compacts it. Uh, it shreds it up a little bit, compacts it. And so now you have these little pellets that mm. are easy to use in the garden. Um, you can mix them in as a fertilizer. That's kind of the common way they're recommended to be used. Wool is a slow release nitrogen, um, and okay. it also helps with moisture retention. So in those, and it's a, it's an NPK, it, there's no phosphorus or potassium, which is huge for us because we have high phosphorus load in our mm. soil, mm -hmm. especially from previous, we just used too much compost when we started out. I just didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so, so I like to find something that's a nitrogen, but I'm not adding any other, you know, stuff. So wool is great for that. But so we were using it first as the pellets in the seed starting mix in our soil blocks. Um, and so we kind of have honed that technique and figured out how really to incorporate them. And then we started doing trials with um, just the raw wool because we don't have a pelletizer. The pelletizer is yes. really expensive. So we'd have to be buying in the pellets. Um, we did have someone who would pelletize it for us, but then we're still having to ship it and then they have to ship it back. It's this whole thing. Correct. So instead we started making uh, wood trays just from cedar scraps and then we line the bottom with raw wool and then we just fill the top with our soil and we just start our seeds in wood trays and those have been amazingly healthy. I mean, I can't believe the 
uh, we grew stocks, so we did we did our stock yeah. seedlings in it, and I, I didn't get a chance to transplant the ones that I was trialing with the with the wool. Yeah, and now they're blooming in the tray, and they look. I mean, even really? as how tight they are in yeah. their tray, they are still performing just like they would outside in the soil, and I haven't fertilized them once. And I did a side by side. The other tray I didn't put wool in. And that one isn't performing nearly as well. And that's been what we've seen with all of our trials is just the mm -hmm. ones with the wool perform so well and we never have to fertilize them, which is huge for time saving, but also for Correct. the cost. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. That's really, really cool. So then um, during the summer, they kind of roam around your farm, kind of work their way through the grass strips, I'm assuming between beds and that sort of thing? Yeah. So on small scale, the way that we've done it is because we are doing regenerative, we, we alternate cover cropping either spring yep. or fall, depending okay. on the bed, you know, depending on what's in there. If it's something spring producing, then we're going to be cover cropping it in the fall and vice versa. If it's something that's a later summer producer, we cover crop it in the spring. And uh, those areas we use... Uh, movable electric fencing so mm -hmm. we'll just do one whole row of you know whether it's a mix of snapdragons and you know so whatever it is that's a cool producer and then we Correct. cover crop that and then once that cover crop is ready to terminate we can just electric fence off that whole row and put the sheep in there and they'll just happily graze that down all day until it's done okay so we're just using a lot of portable electric fencing we also have uh we have an oh, it's perennial rye planted in between our lavender rows Okay. And so we can just put them in the lavender field and they'll graze down the rye, but they don't touch a lot of things. So this is the other benefit when you're talking about like goats versus sheep. Yes. Yes. Like, you know, goats will eat everything. That's sheep correct. are definitely pickier. And, and you know, there's yes. pros and cons to that. Like, yeah, I can't, I can use them to a certain extent to help with some of the invasive weeds that we have, but mm -hmm. a lot of stuff they don't like or can't eat versus goats mm -hmm. are just more resilient they'll just eat more stuff but this is a good thing so when we're grazing them for example with our lavender i don't have to worry about the sheep eating my lavender they just stick they just they only want the grass yes yeah that's cool because we have between our uh blueberries blackberries raspberries all grass strips and that might work for us i'm a little worried they might go after the black the blue blueberries when they're a little bit smaller yeah um, they definitely could um i'm trying to think what a we have golden currant as a hedgerow. I'm trying Correct, to think okay. if they really go after that. I mean, they love the apple. They, I will say they love apple trees. I know a lot of people use them in like orchard grazing. Yes, correct. Yeah. Uh, which I don't quite understand because from my experience, when we've grazed our sheep in our orchard area, they eat the bark off of once they've kind of grazed down to the level that they're happy with. So I think we need to put some kind of protection around the trunks of the trees, but then I think that would work. Well, so to that point, I think it also could be just they need to pulse through those kinds of environments as they need to be in there very quickly. So they're only taking what they really, really want, which is the yep. grass. The and other thing, it, yeah, the other thing it could be is if they're going after the bark, the bark typically contains more minerals. So they mm -hmm. may be mineral short. But again, I don't know what you're feeding. So obviously, you know, yeah, we the, typically free, free range mineral, you know, we okay. just usually yeah. have free mineral out there for them to eat, but they're just. We have one that I think is kind of a, I feel Robust. like, you know, he's yeah. like my kid that is just trying to make me, <laughs> like Roosevelt, our white sheep never does this, but only Midnight the black sheep does it, which is kind of, yeah. I guess, makes sense with the black sheep. Um, <laughs> Too many parallels here, yeah. right? <laughs> he is, he's so naughty. So sometimes I think, and they're smart, they are really smart, which, yeah. You know, they know, like they know if the electric fence isn't on, they can tell. And so mm -hmm. they can hear the clicking and they know if the clicking isn't going that it's not on. And so then they can break down the fence. <laughs> so they're smarter than I think. So sometimes yes. I think like, are you just doing this to mess with me because you want attention? <laughs> I don't know. Yes. But you're right. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely so. I mean, we've just started putting thing, barriers up around the trees because I don't want them killing all the, all the trees that we planted. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things you're pretty passionate about, I see on your Instagram, is you are very, very little plastic. So, I mean, you're plastic free. Talk a little bit about that journey and kind of like how far you've been able to go. Yeah, this is a divisive topic, I think, because mm. a lot of small scale market farmers just, you know, it's become very key to a lot of people's production is this plastic use. And I was there too for my first 
two years we used a lot of landscape fabric right plastic mulch it's called fabric but really it's um it's plastic based and yeah. you know i always felt odd about it but i it was what i saw being done it's what i had learned to do in several books and so i you know and we had really aggressive weed pressure too the weed yeah. seed bank at our property was just so high so I I used it in our first two years and then I started kind of at the third year I was like wait 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 <laughs> yeah. let me stop and catch up at that point my my youngest daughter was finally two and I could kind of you know catch a breath and think about it and then I started doing the research and finding kind of all of the the impact of the microplastic degradation as that happens over years and even over one season um, the phthalate leaching that happens with microplastics into soils. And yeah. the studies that are showing, you know, that those phthalates remain in the soil and they get uptaken by the plant roots and then end up in our produce. So, you know, I was kind of, I didn't always start down this road of being so, I think people think that I'm very staunchly environmentalist. And part of that is because of where I started my farming journey. It really was a healing process for me to mm. start the farm. And I came from a I started the farm from a place of grief. I had just lost my best friend to suicide um, from oh. postpartum depression. Oh, yeah. And yeah, and our babies are the same age and we've been friends since sixth grade. So this was a huge uh, impact on my life. And so that's when we moved to the farm and started the farm as I mm -hmm. just felt like I needed hands in the soil and healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And nature really provided that for me. And so I, I have always felt that I have to pay that back, that I owe it to... Yeah the planet, you know, and, and to earth and its healing properties that it gave me to give that back. So I, so when I started looking at this, I was like, Oh shoot, <laughs> you know, I really, yeah. first of all, I just don't feel comfortable with it myself, you know, and, and that's an individual grower decision. I don't judge growers who do use it because I know that sometimes that's just, that's just the option. Um, but for myself, I, I certainly don't feel comfortable doing so. So yeah, so we, we just started removing it and we started switching to deep mulch systems, um, and also cover cropping pretty heavily. Okay. All right. So then let's talk a little bit about deep mulch. Cause one of the issues with deep mulch is nitrogen tie up. First, let's talk about what are you using for mulch? Yep. So it depends on the area, you know, it depends if it's a perennial area or if it's a annual area, obviously we treat those differently in terms of the mulches that we use. We pretty much stick to wood chips in the in the perennial areas, and I know there's that nitrogen tie-up issue, which is really only proven to happen if you if you mix that mulch into Correct. the surface of the so, into yeah. the soil. You know this, right? So it's just the mm -hmm. top couple inches where that happens, not down where yeah. the perennial plant roots are. But when we're using wood chips in an annual bed, that can happen. You know, like things can just get mixed in there. From what I've found, so I don't love to use heavy carbon wood chip based mulch yeah. in an annual bed. In those beds, I prefer to use things like leaves so our community okay. every year bags up all their leaves they know to bring them to the farm we are very clear with like hey don't bring your leaves if they've had any kind of treatment on your on your trees anything you know because it's just common now that people get yes. their trees sprayed for various things so they'll bring us those bags in the fall we save them all winter and then in the spring we apply them around the plants we also use pine needles um okay. are really a uh, really underused mulch, and I love pine needles, and people think uh, that this is another myth, is that it makes the soil acidic. You probably know that this has been proven to be uh, a myth. Fortunately, it doesn't in some instances <laughs> when you're trying to get it acidic. I know, right? We have very alkaline soil. I'm like, I would love to <laughs> acidify my soil, please. <laughs> yeah. But no, it doesn't. it does not work that way. But it does work very similar to a straw mulch, um, and it doesn't blow away like mm, the leaves do. Yeah. So we get pretty heavy wind pressure. We had category two hurricane gusts this weekend and the leaves tend to blow away in those situations. So the pine needle mulch works really well. Um, we found in the annual bed areas. And then we also do cover cropping. So cover cropping is always my preferred. It's not, I wouldn't say that I'm always able to cover crop my entire field. That's just not the yeah. way that it realistically, you know, happens. Um, but we do try to do at least half of our beds with a fall cover crop. And that's my favorite. You know, if I could pick any mulch, it would be that because planting it in fall, letting it winter kill, and then it just is there in the spring. It's attached to the ground so it doesn't blow away like a lot of our other mulches do. And we just scooch it aside and plant into it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, when we compare it to like a plastic system, so where we used to use, and I've done both, you know, so I can kind of mm -hmm. come at it from like a 
I've done both of these things. You know, rolling it up every fall, storing it, rolling it back out every summer, planning, you know, the spacing you have to know, like, okay, is this a six inch spacing on this plastic yes. or a nine inch or, you know, mm -hmm. there's so, a lot of planning that goes into that. Versus if I can plant a cover crop, which is cheaper, it's less time for me. And especially if it's one that winter kills and I don't have to actively terminate, then I already have my mulch there in the summer, in the spring too. I also don't have to transport mulch around. So it saves me time and it's making our soil better at the same time. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then, and you don't do any, like you have like a small seed starting greenhouse. You don't do any like uh, low tunnels or like um, caterpillar tunnels. I used to, okay. and I just, I found that the time that it took me um, over the winter, it just didn't make sense either economically or just from a, from a human standpoint, I was spending so much time opening and closing tunnels, you know, in Colorado, we're really, uh, we're higher altitude. So our mm -hmm. sun is super intense and we were constantly having to open and close and open and close. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't get that great of a return on that time from, from what I found. Um, again, we did mostly low tunnels. I've, I've done some high tunnel growing. Um, right now my high tunnel is just a storage space for, for our, our equipment because I'm, we're, we're off the farm right now. We're working on a, a workshop edition space. Um, yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't personally do a lot of tunnel growing anymore. I did when I started, but it's just, yeah, yeah. I think for the time for me, it just, it wasn't making sense for the return. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, Talk a little bit about seed starting, because typically that's done with uh, plastic trays and all of that. What have you switched to for that? Yeah, we started with soil blocking, um, which you've probably heard about, which is just mm -hmm. basically creating your container and your soil is in one little handy cube. And when I started soil blocking, um, you know, all of the instructionals that we were finding was how to do it in a 1020 tray which to me was counterintuitive because I was like, well, I'm trying to reduce my plastic and I'm putting it in a plastic tray. So how is this actually reducing plastic? Correct. You know, yes, I, I guess a 1020 technically has less plastic than a, than a cell tray, but to me, it still felt like, okay, this is, let's find something else. And there was a restaurant going out of business down the street from me and they, they were a very old school business. So they just microwaved a lot of their food. So they had all these like, cafeteria trays okay. and they were these fiberglass trays and I just drove by one day and I saw them and I was like well maybe these would work for some yeah. talking. so I went in and I said well how much for these trays and they were they basically let me take all of them for 20 bucks which in hindsight was yeah a, a steal because the fiberglass trays aren't aren't cheap no but they are so sturdy and what I love about them is that you know, with soil blocking, because we're wetting the soil first and then putting it in, and it's usually wetter than typical soil for seed starting, is it, it's heavy. So when we were using 1020 trays, we were finding we were having a lot of breakage of the trays. And, uh, you know, you pick them up and they bend and then the blocks get all, it, it just is frustrating. And so Correct. the fiberglass yeah. trays are so sturdy that we can pick them up with one hand, even with 280 mini blocks, and it doesn't bend. It doesn't fold, you know, I, they're going to last, gosh, decades. Yeah. So to me, that was, a, that was a better option. So we started down that path. That was what we started with. But then as I started teaching people this, you know, and I realized, okay, well, I got these trays <laughs> for very cheap, but people who are having to buy these are, are this is a significant output at the beginning to buy these fiberglass trays. I don't want to quote a price, but I want to say like the, the size that we use is probably 10 to $15 a tray. Yeah. That's not cheap, you know, when you're starting out. And so we started thinking, well, what can we do that's more accessible? And that's when we started using the wood trays, which is something that nurseries used to do, you know, before <laughs> pre-plastic, this is what they correct, would do is correct. grow in yeah. wood trays. So it's really not anything new, but it's new in terms of no one's really doing it anymore. Uh, I know there are a few, that's not true. There are a few growers who are, who are still definitely using them. Um, and Elliot Coleman is one who, you know, created soil blocking and he Correct. uses wood yeah. trays. So, but we started building them out of scrap wood. Um, and then I was like, well, can I go a step further and not even get the soil blocker and just make blocks by hand? And so that's what we started doing. We just filled the trays, wet the trays 
with, you know, with the soil in them. So that it was you know, pretty moist. And then we just mm -hmm. use a bench scraper to divide, to make manual blocks. Um, there's not as much division as like with the typical soil blocker, you know, they really kind of hold their shape and they, they have a very firm cube. That's okay. not really the case so much with the wood tray ones that we do, but they do the job. You know, it, they, the ones that we've been growing there have performed great and it's much cheaper if you're sourcing scrap lumber, you know, it's more eco-friendly if you're trying to really be plastic free. So. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So those are the big three areas that you've switched over. In the jungle of farm and small business software options out there, why should farmers care about a new option like Farmhand? I'm here with Ari, the founder and CEO. Ari, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff out there, but it's pretty difficult for farmers to use. Farmhand makes things a lot easier. You can just text or email and we'll manage all of those different systems that are hard for you to use, like the website, the communications, payments, CSA management, marketing, design, all in one. And there's customer service around that for you and your customers. So I would say we're a ready to ride vehicle in a sea of parts vendors. So it's completely different and a much easier experience for farmers. So how does this play out with, let's say like a website? We'll establish your website with input from you. And that website will always stay up to date as you can make simple changes to it by sending a text or email. We'll design it. We'll make sure that it works on mobile phones, on computers. It's professional. It meets your brand. It tells your story and it showcases your products to the local customers that are trying to find you. Mm. And then on communications, that's something that farmers a lot of times struggle with just because they're so busy. Absolutely. Sending something like a newsletter seems like it should be easy, but when you're preparing the images and visuals, writing the content, curating the recipes, communicating what you actually have available that's in season, all of those pieces can take time and often hours every week. So to be consistent and to do it effectively, it makes sense to use an expert and partner like us to help you formulate that template and create that interface for you to just quickly share those updates receive drafts and have them approved to send to your customers. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes hand in hand with customer service too. having someone who can respond to customers when you're in the middle of the field, fixing an irrigation leak or, you know, trying to get the harvest in. Absolutely. If you're a farmer, you're probably farming during the day. So it's pretty difficult to pick up the phone, answer emails and be customer service all at once. And consumers just demand uh, immediate response. They get frustrated if they don't get responses from whoever they're buying from. So Farmhand provides seven day a week service for both you and your customers, executing your customer service policies, organizing questions we can't answer for you and providing it to you once you're back online and able to answer. Mm. I know one of the farms that you've worked with, Tierra Vegetables, they were facing operational challenges, trying to manage their 100 plus CSA members on scattered systems, including a website, email software, a payment processor, and finally CSA software. So seeking efficiency and enhanced customer experience, they found a perfect solution in farmhand and the time and cost savings were instant. Now they had 14% revenue growth and saved $128 a month in software savings. Yeah, absolutely. Those costs can add up, especially as your member list grows and as you start using different software for different things. And so that consolidation gives you immediate software savings when you move to farmhand. And then from a workflow and efficiency standpoint, it takes a lot of time to do all these things, whether you're sending newsletters, updating customers, responding to customers, updating spreadsheets for your different fulfillment days. And so again, from those workflow efficiencies, that time can then be reinvested in more strategic items like upsells, flash sales, expanding the CSA locations or value added items. The list is endless. And so that's exactly what Tierra did. Awesome. Farmers are busy, so Farmhand has built a platform that they can leverage anywhere, anytime through email or SMS. Farmers can easily update their storefront, update communications to customers, and keep tabs on invoices and payments. No learning curve, just speak and write. And then where do you want folks to go? You can visit farmhand.partners slash podcast. That's farmhand.partners slash podcast.
Now, I know your business has changed since you started. Where kind of like is the focus now? I know you do classes. You also do some bouquets. Talk a little bit about how that's developed. Yeah. Um, I always think that it's smart for farmers to first consider, you know, themselves. But when they're thinking about their market, like, you know, what kind of a person am I? Am I someone who likes to deal with retail and I like to deal with the public a lot? Or am I someone who more is more of an introvert and prefers to, <laughs> to do that less? Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of our evolution has come from is, you know, it's not that I've become more of an introvert, although I kind of have, but just with having a little bit more um, social media visibility, I just am more wary with having people on farm. And so we've definitely reduced the amount of on-farm stuff that we do. But also, I, I just, at the end of the day, I'm usually just exhausted with my, you know, I have homeschool, I have two kids. So, Correct, So yes. for me, the season that we're in is that, you know, I've, I've definitely slimmed down my on-farm offerings and I'm doing more online education. But we do still do weddings because they are our biggest revenue source. Um, okay. They help me pay my farm hand. And so <laughs> anything that's going to help me pay my employees is, is going to be a good thing. So it, when we're looking at flowers, the revenue that we can make from wedding florals is significantly higher than, say, a farmer's market. Okay. And I have never done farmer's markets off-site because I, I did a couple my first year, you know, just kind of where you do the pop-in. <laughs> And it's exhausting. Yeah. You know, I mean, people underestimate bless farmers that do farmers markets because people think like, oh, you just wake up at three and harvest a few things and throw it in the yeah. truck. And no. That is not, you know, we all know that's not the case. It's really time intensive and, and energy intensive. So, and not always for a great return. You know, it depends yes. on the market. It depends on the day. Depends on the heat, which is a big, a big thing with us, with the flowers. It's most of the farmers markets are just so hot. You know, the, the, they're usually on asphalt, and so the flowers uh -huh. are sitting there wilting. I don't feel good selling, selling wilting flowers. So, so we just, it's just something that I've learned over time that I just don't do. If I had better options, you know, that were shaded or you know, a, little bit, a little bit cooler or, you know, closer to the farm, then, then that's something that maybe I would consider. But it's, it's a really individual farm decision is, you know, do you enjoy doing markets? Is that something Correct. that... If you don't like to do it, it's not going to be sustainable. Yes. Yeah. Um, so then talk to me a little bit about the types of classes that you do. We mostly now do, well, we do both. We do gardening classes and we do flower arranging. Okay. It kind of, we have, we have a couple different audiences, you know, one is just like, I love flowers. And the other one is, I love this kind of gardening sustainable side. So we try to do classes for both. Um, so our, one of our more popular classes is just regenerative gardening, which is what we do on an agricultural scale, but more geared at a home gardener. And then we do flower arranging classes. It kind of varies every year. Some, day, some years we'll do bridal bouquets. Some years we just do centerpieces. Uh, one that I like to call the flower farmer experience, where they get to come and they pick their own flowers, and then they get to arrange them themselves, which people really love to do. I've just found that people prefer to cut their own rather than have us pre-harvest them and have them sitting there for them to cut. Sometimes that's the only option depending on the weather, but in general, we find they like to cut them and, and have yeah. that kind of experience, even gotcha. though we know that's not really like the flower yeah. farmer experience, right? Like here, we'll hand you a, a hoe and you can weed. <laughs> that's the flower farmer experience. Yes, yes, yes. Now that's, uh, that doesn't go over too well. Um, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those things like the work we need is trellising blackberries for six hours, but you're not going to get a volunteer <laughs> to show up and trellis blackberry. They want to, you know, pick a few flowers and, and think right. anyway. So yeah, that's, that's, yeah, the, the volunteer. Reasons. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's a whole nother, yeah. Can of worms, right? Um, yeah. So we'll, we are, we are actually revisiting that on our farm because we keep getting more and more requests for that. And so yeah. we're trying to figure out what makes that work. We now have steady staff that work Saturdays. And so we've thought of making Saturday mornings that, but we'll see. We've got to figure out yeah. so many different details. How did you, right. And there are so many things that go into having a volunteer on the farm, you know, and we, mm -hmm. I didn't even know my first year or two, all the regulations around volunteers. <laughs> Correct. People yeah. are just like, well, why don't you just, you know, I'll well, say something on Instagram, like, oh my gosh, we're just overrun with weeds right now. And someone will say, well, why don't you just do a volunteer day? And I say, I, legally, I can't. Correct. You know, Correct. and so I many can't. people don't yes. understand that. And, well, you know, and I get that, yeah, people want to help with agriculture, but at the end of the day, 
if we're a for profit business, it's just not it's not legal and we just correct can't. correct. So, so yeah, but making it like a class, right? Like what you want to do, like a wine and weed class? You have a- <laughs> so that actually there are people that do that. Yes, um, yes, right. Exactly. <laughs> so I yeah. just feel weird. I, personally, I feel weird about doing that, but yes. I know that a lot of people do it, and I'm sure people love coming and doing that too. So, well, I mean, your your farm is beautiful enough that I'm sure that would work. Our farm is still production. We're getting there. It's starting to look better. We're near three, and so stuff is really starting to turn around from you know the, the chaos yep. of the beginning. Set up, but. Um, we, I mean, so technically we have two businesses. We have a nonprofit here as well as a for-profit. So we technically could have them work through the nonprofit and we'd call it an educational class where part of their educational uh-huh. class is, you know, weeding and all of that. But yeah, it's, um, on one aspect, I get some of the reasoning behind it, but on another aspect, okay, this is just another way to have basically, um, to not let small businesses succeed. If someone wants to show up and wants to learn how this is happening and wants to put some time in, why can't they? Because they even limit if you do a work trade. So aspect, if someone were to come and like, you know, earn, you know, $30 and you give them three bags of lettuce, the government wants you to pay all the taxes on that. Right. Um, You have to issue a 1099. uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the more and more I, and I'm going to get flack for this. The more and more I deal with the government, because we deal with so many different agencies and so many different levels. We just started dealing with the EPA this year. Um, fun. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that was so much fun. Um, <laughs> you know, they have no idea. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. But no, I, I, yes, no, I, I totally understand. I get flack all the time, so I don't care. So yes. I don't mind saying it. But, but no, I agree. And, and I do think that there's something to say for the people I think would get a lot out of being on a farm and mm-hmm. actually getting hands-on experience and seeing what farmers do deal with. Um, one of the ways we kind of worked to, we actually, our first, no, it wasn't our first year. It was our second and third season. We did an internship. Mm, um, and yeah. we did that through, we had to do it through the college. You know, we had to oh, give a certain number of educational yeah. hours per week. And there was all kinds of reporting that we had to do with, through the school. Um, and they had a horticulture program. So it made sense. You know, people yeah. who wanted to go into this line of work, but honestly, it ended up being so much work for me that I just couldn't keep it going. You know, you, I, I had hoped that having a bunch of interns would help. And you might know if you've done interns or volunteers that bless their hearts, you know, they try really hard, but there's just some things that, you know, you have to come back and if you don't have the same employee, so now I have one employee that I've had for five years and she, you know, I can tell her to do something and she'll do it. And she's well mm-hmm. worth the money that I pay her and I pay her well. Um, and that is worth it because she can do the work of five interns, you know? Correct. And, and so to me, I'm like, well, I'm going to invest in this one person and really educate that person rather than have to go back in after my volunteers have left and redo things. Or like one time we had someone pull up all of our beans. Oh dear. One of the interns, when we were weeding and, and thought all the beans were weeds and pulled them all, yeah. you know, and it, it's Yes. What do you do? You know, you're, you you can't well, be you can't be watching everyone all the time. Yeah, I mean, we had an intern who was being shown how to use an expensive cedar, snap an expensive cedar, in a part that wasn't available locally. So now you oh. have to try to overnight it, or you have to because again, this was ha- and it was one of those time key pieces. pieces. Yeah, and you had again, it's one of those things. We have a drop dead date to get fall carrots in. It's July in upstate New York. This is in upstate New York. Our business up there. It's July fourth, and this was July third. So now we were, you know, struggle. Anyway, yes, um, yes. And the biggest thing, because I've been an intern and I've had interns, is expectations is everything. Is yes. they expect to come out and you know fiddle through the flower fields and see some butterflies and prune a few things here and there, but it's like okay guys, we're weeding this morning and it's four hours hot. The sun's on their back, their back hurts. Um, yeah. And again, I'm not. And they don't love that. We lost a lot of that. interns that way. <laughs> yeah. So my thing with the old internship thing is I don't think it's a bad thing. The problem is you also have to make sure you meet federal minimum wage on that. Or I, right. think, I don't know if it's state minimum wage. And California just went to 20 bucks an hour for minimum wage. Right. That's so, insane. I mean, I mean that, I don't know how you do it. Um, I don't either. Uh, so, and again, the thing, I think it's the size of the farm. So if you have a massive farm and you are able to devote your life to managing the business and then doing education for, you know, a group of six or eight interns, I think that could work, but a very small farm that's desperately just trying to get by, 
they don't a lot of times have the time to do what interns consider correct education. Right, right. Um, and that was just it. Is if by the time you're doing really educating and I think it yeah. was it was a minimum of, of eight hours a week, I wanna say, of education time that we had wow. to put in. It just ended yeah. up being like I, this isn't worth it. This is it's costing me more to, to do this mm-hmm. than it would be to just hire someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right now we have a fabulous staff of all employees. We do have a few contractors that, that just they need to be contractors for what they're mm-hmm. doing for us and all that stuff. But and um, I just want I just want them to come up. I want them to work 40 hours a week. I know when they show up. I know when they're working. And uh, we're staffed now for six days a week. So Monday through Saturday, we have good solid staff and it works. Yeah. Well, and it clears you up to be able to figure out the best workflow for all of that stuff too, because if you're just kind of flying by the seat of your pants Mm -hmm. and like people show up and they're like, okay, wait, now I have to think about what I can assign to all these people. I mean, there's planning time that goes into all of that. Correct. And we're still a very young crew. So there's still a lot of, okay, this is the first time we planted tomatoes guys. Let's get together. We're going to show you how to do it. But at least now that once I've started them on a project, I can usually walk and go start the next thing. So yeah, yeah, but it's, I think it's an interesting challenge and I think that there needs to be more work done around it um, mm-hmm. because, I mean, we're, we're looking at people spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to get, get degrees they don't need. Um, and a lot of time, unfortunately, they're pressured by parents. We have some very sweet young ladies that work for us. Um, and one of them would love to be farming full time. That's her dream. She's talked about it. She lights up every time she visits the farm. But her family, and again, this isn't a decree. This is a... We think you should go to college and get a degree because these there's generations of women in your family that have done this particular thing, so you should get that too. I don't know if she mm-hmm. just feels guilty or if that's been t- actually said, but she, uh, you know, she, anyway. You can that? <laughs> I can't say anymore, but it's just incredibly sad to see the inter the personal drama that has created in her life to basically fulfill the wishes of her family. Um, and how it's harming her. And again, thankfully she's in a family that can afford the schooling. So she doesn't have to rack up that personal debt, but so many of these kids are putting their personal debt and now they're stuck in a nine to five job that they hate. They can never become a full-time farmer because as you know, farming is not a very lucrative. It can be profitable, but it's not, you know, right. lucrative, especially at right. the start, you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, which you can't do. So, um, yeah, it can be profitable, but, but will it pay off? hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, 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 very infrequently. Right. So yeah. So yeah. And we, we have a situation too, where we both, I mean, we came into our farm with $200,000 in student loan debt. Um, mm. You know, and, and my husband really doesn't farm. I mean, he's not involved in the farm. It's not his thing. He's just not a passionate farmer. He helps me with uh, irrigation because <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm terrible at that. <laughs> yes. But but he he works an off-farm job, and that's his preference. Um, he loves what he does. He's very passionate about what mm-hmm. he does. And we're really lucky that the thing that he did go to school for, you know, actually pays a living wage, a, a, a good wage. But yeah, it is one of those conundrums where it's like most farmers are having to work an off farm job. You, I, I mean, even Correct. for myself, I can't, you know, when I was just farming and not doing any of the educational bit, and I know there's a lot of social media mm-hmm. viral posts that fly around about like, you can make six figures you know, farming. growing an acre, what I, you know, I'm not going to sh- put out a specific plant, but I know there's one that gets thrown yes. around. Yes. Um, and seven days, so you can be harvesting $10,000. Yes. Oh, I know exactly but, what you're and talking most about. Of these people are selling, you and know, training hundred dollar and... to $500 courses. Correct. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, are you, are you including that income in what you're telling people they can make? Because really it looks like you're not selling really flowers. You're selling a course, which is fine. You know, Correct. I love people teaching people how to farm is awesome, but don't, don't do it under the guise of you can make all the money that I'm making when really the money that you're making is off of workshops and not off of, you know, great. Correct. People want to and do workshops. That's great. But when I just was selling flowers, I wasn't. Ma- <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, and, and oh. gross is very different than net. Yep. So right. I can make yep. 500 to a thousand dollars. I mean, we here at the farm do a 
do a, we're actually it's growing rapidly our microgreen production we've done microgreens for now 18 years been selling microgreens so I know, yes, they're profitable tray, but there's also incredible uh, expense in that. And has anyone priced out a 25 pound bag of sunflower seed from Johnny's lately? Or, you know, um, not even Johnny's, but like True Leaf or something like that. And again, anyone. I'm, yep. yeah, they're, it's expensive, the cost that goes into it. So I would say, I was talking to a friend of mine recently and I was saying our, um, our farm in upstate New York, after 10 years, we finally broke the $500,000 barrier the farm on central Which, here um is in year three broke five hundred thousand dollars in year free, three this year the farm side of it will probably break 650 maybe seven um but that's including the retail store so we now have an on-farm retail store where we bring products in and i told the i told this farmers like i would not be able to pay our crew and do what we do without the on-farm store where we work with that we have 30 now 30 vendors in there um just yep. because um retail is incredibly profitable farming right. oh yeah is so much more than wholesale yes. mm -hmm. oh yeah so that's what you're even when you're selling like at a farmer's market selling that raw product at a farmer's market because i can sell a cucumber for a dollar i can sell two cucumbers in a jar for nine dollars right i mean right. which ones them more now they're, yeah yeah right now granted for a certified kitchen, you're looking at a, you know a significant amount of investment, but um, after that investment, now you're actually making real money. Well, and that's just it. The the initial investments are not included in a lot of these advertisements that are meant to sell courses, you know, and that are meant mm -hmm. to. It's just like anything. It's not just in farming, right? It's in any industry. For, you know, you can make a million dollars on Instagram or whatever it is. Most of those people are, are not actually selling a product; they're selling a course, mm -hmm. and 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 all of that initial investment in whatever it is that they're trying to get you to do isn't usually included. So yeah, if you want to sell and grow an acre of peonies, great. But you're not talking about the initial investment in the roots, the cooler. How are you going to sell all of those peonies that are all going to bloom at the same time mm -hmm. without doing it wholesale, which as you mentioned is a much lower revenue rate than selling at retail. And does that make sense compared to, okay, just plant a few hundred peonies, sell them all retail. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're, um, minimizing how much cooler space you have to keep, how much storage, how much shipping, all of that stuff. I mean, there's there's so many intricacies, as you know, that go into all of these things. And I think it often gets brushed over in the name of, you know, making, yes. of, making a viral video. <laughs> yes. Well, and I, I don't I don't want to um, completely demonize or maybe just, you know, um, abrade the aspect online because there is that aspect of people needing it. Again, we are a education company. You're an education company. You're yep. also selling that. So on one aspect, we want to balance the aspect of here's what's possible with here's what is actually viable. Um, and that's something I have really, like we've really started working backwards of like, okay, what is actually, what are they going to actually do? And you yeah. know, what's the and actual And give the investment? numbers, give the real yeah. numbers. Yeah. 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 Don't, don't brush it with a broad stroke. Do people want to be farmers? Yeah. I think that's awesome. You know, there are, our generation is really wanting to get back to, Cause I think. It, Cause we're under 1% farmers now. And that's right. incredibly yeah. scary of, of that many people don't know how to do anything. I mean, I forget what recently someone said to me and I almost had to do a double take and I was like, you don't really know, do you? And I forget, and it's something that was, that kind of blew my mind and I forget now, unfortunately, but it was one of those things that you're like, it's like the whole thing of like, do eggs come from eggplants? That was, you know, it, you, but kids believe that. Unfortunately, yeah. kids believe yeah. that because they yeah. haven't been to a farm. And right. I think we are facing that aspect and people do want to become farmers, but unfortunately our system has geared up and set up to, um, you know, prioritize the far four large massive you know agri industrial complex businesses mm -hmm. and uh, make it very challenging for the small farmer yeah yeah and it, it is you know I, I think the more people we can get involved in agriculture and educated about ag agriculture those things are awesome but let's be realistic about you know also educating about the the investment that's in, included and involved in the startup we have an interesting situation because I'm actually, I'm a fifth generation farmer of one of those commodity crops that you yeah. <laughs> mentioned for primarily two corn and soybeans. And, um, but until two generations ago, well, until really last generation, it was a dairy farm too. You know, mm, they did everything yeah. and it's just yeah. really recently that it's become so monoculture driven. Um, but 
in that, you know, we still have 200 acres in production that are corn and soybean. Mm -hmm. And so we, and we don't farm it ourselves. We rent out that land to our neighbors, but we do have really in-depth conversations with them about all these struggles. And, you know, Mm -hmm. so we know quite a bit about their challenges and then that's a big reason why I do what I do because I'm set to inherit that farm. I'm set to run that farm. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not like, you know, it's not like we're rich. My yeah. dad had to go fight in Vietnam to afford to go to college. You know, it, mm-hmm. yeah, we have mm-hmm. land, but that doesn't mean we have liquidity. Correct. Uh, we're just trying yes. to keep our family farm and our family. Yes. And so they're, they, so it's been really interesting talking to them too and, and learning the struggles that they have. And thankfully, they've been super open about, you know, as I've been doing all of this work, mm-hmm. which is a big reason why I do it, is so that I can have some kind of legitimacy when I go to talk to them about mm-hmm. things like, let's get into cover cropping, let's reduce mm-hmm. tillage. Um, and they've been great about listening to those things. Um, they've attended a couple of soil health conferences with me. They started implementing no-till practices mm-hmm. on our farm 100% this last year. And they put in a cover, they put in a biodiverse cover crop. I think they did a four species cover crop, which nice. is huge. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. you know, but, but we always have to talk about it with them from an economic standpoint, because for the, for it is, it's a financial thing. People think farmers are rich and rolling in money. They can have one bad season and then they have to sell their farm. And then people get mad about that. All the farmers are selling and it's all getting developed, but it's like, they are up against a rock and a hard place too. Mm-hmm. So we try to look, we try to come up with ways of like, okay, here's how this is going to save you money. You know, if we start like incorporating these legume cover crops, then we can cut the nitrogen Correct. application in the mm-hmm. spring. Or we can, if we're cutting tillage, we're cutting overall labor time, we're cutting gas, we're cutting mechanical equipment, maintenance yeah. and all this stuff. So yes, at the end of the day, our yield might be a little bit lower. However... We're making up for that on lowered input expenses. So it's been Correct. really interesting for me looking at it from both of these standpoints, because I think a lot of what I hear is, well, what you do can't be scaled. And I think everything you just said there is so key and so true and in one aspect so awful because yeah. you are dealing with tens of thousands of farmers who know that all the equity they have is their land. And, and their equipment. Uh, and their equipment. And right now, I, so just, just yesterday, I am contracting locally for someone to grow us several acres of straw because we've struggled incredibly with getting high-quality straw. So I finally found someone that's growing the acreage for me. He sent me a picture the other day. It looked good. We started chatting back and forth. And he says something about uh, how all the farmers in the area are freaking out right now. And I was like, oh, well, corn prices. Mm-hmm. Corn prices They're have down. gone off a cliff. Yeah. And so these farmers, yes, they may have $2 million in equity in, in their land, but they don't have two pennies to rub together. Right. They are now in the whole cycle of owing the bank for nine months out of the year until they sell the crop, and now the crop isn't even paying for itself. And so when you talk to them about, hey, maybe you need to clean up your waterways, they literally want to... Yeah, they don't want to hear that because they're like, well, I can't make any money as it is. They've been told for decades, you're the backbone of America. You're feeding America. Do what you do. You're doing the best job ever. And they feel that way. And you've been blamed for so much. Yeah. And now they've been blamed for so much too. Yes, you're absolutely Mm -hmm. correct. And it's really interesting that a lot of them too are also, we experienced this last year. There is a little bit of a farmer mafia in the aspect of everyone's growing corn. Everyone's growing mm-hmm. soy. If you start growing something different and maybe you're making more money off that something different, you're now shamed. So we recently were looking for land. We finally were able to find seven acres of land. And the guy was very happy because he was getting paid $350 every single year for his five acres. We came in with a proposal to pay him $350 an acre after three years because after we got through our transition, we could now be go, go organic. We said, we'll, we'll ramp up to $350 per acre. He was like, okay, let's sign. Well, this other farmer didn't want to leave the land because he had been getting the sweetheart deal. Right. And basically, I, after this whole deal went through, we ended up paying the other farmer to leave the land, paying all his expenses for the last year to, uh, for the land. And I went to another farmer. I was like, hey, I need to do some field work on this. We need to do a deep chisel to kind of break up hard pan. Oh, I'm not going to touch that. He said, what you did over there was awful. And I was like, what do you mean it was awful? And he's like, well, you took the land away from him. He's like, well, you can afford to pay more for land. He can't afford to pay that. And I was like, wait a minute. 
I said, you know that he was paying $50 an acre for that land every single year. And you know the going rate is $200 an acre. So right. he was paying so that early. guy. So over 20 years, I, I calculated that that landowner lost $20,000. Because you were underpaying him and making him feel bad that he was helping out the local farmer, but he was, in essence, making good money off of him. And there is a, you know, yeah, and there, and there is, and it's especially true of small rural towns that, you know, Correct. we've dealt with this too on our home farm of like, don't talk to someone, you, you know, if you talk to yeah. someone else and there's relationships that you, that, you know, we don't even know about that <laughs> there's some kind of yeah. bad blood from the past or something. This family doesn't talk to this family. And, and there is a lot. A lot of that, and that's what, you know, we've found that the best thing is just to, a lot of those investments that we talk about making in terms of cover crops, in terms mm -hmm. of CRP land, you know, we've done CRP land and we just say, you know, well, we'll pay for initial investment on, on X or Y because, and especially with like cover cropping. I mean, we offered in our lease and actually they, they didn't want to do this. They said, no, we'll pay for the cover crop, but we had offered to pay for the cover crop seed. Yeah. Um, just to implement because for them, it's a big risk, you know? And so mm -hmm. when we're talking about cover cropping my acre and a half, you know, yeah. if something goes awry, it's not, it's not a thousand acres, you know, Correct. like they're farming. Yeah. It's it, if they cover crop something and there's a drought year and there's a dry spring and now their cover crop is taking all of their water for their, mm -hmm. for their incoming corn crop then they're looking at huge yield hits. And like you said, Correct. they already have, most of yeah. them have, what is it, like millions of, some millions of dollars of debt. Mm -hmm. So they can't afford to take those risks. And and we need to, I mean, it's it, it's also a farm bill issue. You know, the farm bill really needs to be incentivizing farmers, being able to take those risks and, and doing things like cover cropping, but not just in monoculture Correct. systems either. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know where the farm bill's going. I know they're working on it. Um but yeah, it changes all the time. I feel like I'm, yeah, I'm just, it's, I'm just always disappointed in what finally comes out of it, but it really comes back down to who's paying the salaries of the elected officials and who really is paying the salaries is all the corporate money going into farming. Um, you got Bayer, you've got, um, uh, ConAgra. I mean, all these, these four or five basically companies that control all of farming. But here's now the thing too. And again, we're completely off topic, but at this point, I don't care. <laughs> um, here's the thing is those companies are now controlled by Vanguard, BlackRock, and the other big investment companies. And what you've got is a bunch of people that all they do is in New York City is spend um, all their day running numbers. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if X makes more monetary Maybe sense than Y, that's what they're going to do. And so now they're pushing these, you know, the Bayers and the well, Monsanto's gone now. Um, but all these massive ag companies, which are then pushing the farm bill, which is then pushing the extension agents on the ground to tell what is going to make these massive investment companies the most money. And it's not thinking a bit about the water, the soil, the farmer, the community. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well said. Yep. Anyway, this was supposed to be your podcast, but unfortunately, I kind of got on <laughs> no, a I really like soapbox. how we <laughs> um, This, I, your Instagram is absolutely fantabulous, and I can see why you are just rocking it over there. Tell me a little bit about the B Hotel that you've got on there, because I think anything to take away from this, obviously, go follow you over there. They will get a complete education in so many of the things that you do, because you do some, you don't just do pictures. You do really great content that gives okay. you a full... Um, education. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, we've been trying to get more into YouTube too. It just lets us go more uh -huh. into nuance. That, you know, uh -huh. short term media, short form media is just, it's so hard to get across a point in 60 seconds. Correct. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. And the caption. But um, yeah, a lot of the things that we talk about are, you know, promoting biodiversity. And one of the things I've been super into learning about is, um, you know, I listen to the Regenerative Agriculture podcast a lot, uh -huh. and he has uh -huh. some great speakers about you know, bug entomology and how plants interact with pests and how they can send out distress signals once they start to be attacked and those distress Correct. signals attract the right biodiverse range of beneficial insects. But if we start interfering with that, mm. how that can skew. So a lot of the things that, that I focus on are, are things that will help increase biodiversity. And whenever possible, I try to do things that are done by nature, you know, so growing plants that like yarrow is a great example, especially mm, in a perimeter yes. around the farm and cutting that stem halfway down in the fall and then leaving it. And so that way we've got natural nesting spots for all of our beneficial, you know, native pollinators and various insects, leaving leaf 
mulch around. So we talked about that we use a lot of leaves. Um, you know, pests come in on that stuff too, but we just found that the more we can overall leave things alone as much as possible, <laughs> the, the better things yeah. tend to equalize. Yeah, because this bee hotel, I think it's an allium. It's Millennium Allium. Yes, and yes, and that's one that we have planted around our pergola. And actually, uh, when I planted it, I didn't really realize how many bees it was going to attract until yeah. <laughs> until we were all sitting, you know, sitting there and they were blooming for the first year, and my kids were terrified because they were <laughs> literally yes. surrounded. There's just bees everywhere, but you know, they don't they don't bother, they don't care. They're just focused on the, on the plant. But yeah, yeah um, Allium is a great one. And Allium is one of the few that has been actually researched and, and proven as a companion plant. You know, we hear a lot about mm, companion yeah. planting and you should plant X with Y, but you shouldn't plant Y with Z. And um, and a lot of that has really been misproven. And I think it's, it overcomplicates things for a lot of growers and gardeners mm. and farmers alike. But one thing that has been shown is garlic alliums, that those things are, are really one of the only interplanting crops right now that we found to yes. really help with truly so with, with those issues. One of the things we did this a couple of years ago, and I need to do it again, is we would put a row of garlic down the our strawberry beds because we do a tremendous amount of strawberries every single year. And um, the garlic that was down the strawberry beds did the best. Well, yeah. we baby our strawberries to begin with because they're our biggest cash crop. Oh, but okay. um it, it actually was, yeah, there's so many benefits. So I think we're going to go back to that. Is, yeah, um, we did onions. Yeah. We did the same. We did onions and the strawberries last yeah. year, and they performed great. The bed with the, yeah, the bed with the onions did so much better in terms of pest uh, reduction versus the control bed that didn't have it in there. Um, but we also mm -hmm. do, we do garlic with our roses, um, yeah. you know, in terms of more ornamental things. And, and a lot of that garlic I didn't even harvest last year. I just left it in the ground. So now we just have like, <laughs> Oh, garlic coming up everywhere. Pushy garlic yeah. sprouting everywhere. But yeah. so what? You know, if you're not harvesting it, it doesn't matter how big the bulbs are. Yeah. It's just One of the things we're doing a lot of is these um, perennial edge beds. So around our property, we have about 800 feet of edge effect. And we want to have like a designated barrier. So we're doing a lot of mounds, um, swales kind of, um, and planting elderberries and trees and stuff. But I want to actually now interplant with all of that uh, perennial flowers that we can a uh, let people harvest for their CSA bouquets and then B are going to attract a bunch of um, pollinators because we're already doing a lot of pollinators and we have bees on site and we're trying to attract native bees and all that but if there's I'm thinking now 800 feet how many flower plants can I fit in there oh yeah a ton and that's what we always tell people too is like you don't have to put these things in your you know in your annual beds or in your annual mm -hmm. rows you know I, I think a lot of people say biodiversity. And then as a farmer, you're thinking like, well, this is really hard to implement because I have to harvest still efficiently. Mm -hmm. And I still, if I'm cover cropping, I can't be cover cropping with a bunch of perennials in there. Um, so doing it as a perimeter is a really smart way to do it because you can also worry less about spread doing it that mm -hmm. way. So say something like yarrow, which I love to plant, but let's face it is a pretty aggressive spreader yeah. and reseeder. So let's put that somewhere away from our main production bed, Correct. but yes. still, you know, get some of the benefits of it. And you know, when we're doing that, native is always best. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's benefits to having biodiversity of non-native stuff too, like like our allium. Millennium is, is not really a native, but um, yeah. but having a biodiverse range. And we've actually found that having some non-native with our native is helpful because, you know, honeybees are also non-native. And so Correct. if we have something that the honeybees can focus on, and then we can save the native stuff for our specialist pollinators and the honeybees aren't trying to compete with them, for those. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, biodiversity in general. Yeah. Yeah. So are there any yarrows that aren't aggressive self-seeders, any sterile hybrids? You know, the cultivars are definitely less aggressive okay. I've found. So one that I love to grow and, and every time I post it, people are like, what is this? It's, it's a very similar color, which is one thing that we look for when we're growing a native R, you know, a cultivar of a native oh, plant, especially, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. is that it has a similar bloom color and the same leaf color. So once you start changing those those functions, it affects the way that pollinators see them and uh, utilize them yes, and detect their yes. magnetic force. And so um, if we can keep the color somewhat similar. So the peach, I, I grow firefly peach sky is one of the mm -hmm. ones that I like to grow. And it's this kind of peachy very nice for cutting, um, but it's also kind of similar to a, a yellow yarrow. Yes. And so in the color, it's very similar. And we found that 
the, the beneficials love it just as much as our native version. Um, but it does not spread nearly as nearly, nearly as aggressive as, as we yeah. also have the white native version. That one spreads, and so we have it kind of in a spot where I don't mind it spreading. Mm -hmm. But this one is actually in our field, and it hasn't. I haven't seen it pop up anywhere else. So, and it's mm. year four now, four or five. So that's the you did a little uh, short video harvesting it with this big scythe thing in Um <laughs> That's the video of that color. Yeah, that is gorgeous. I mean, it's stunning. It is a really pretty yarrow, and it stands yeah. up nicely, which is one thing that, you know, part of that is because we leave the stems in place from the previous year. So it kind oh. of provides a natural stand okay. for itself. And then the stems are also going to be beneficial habitat and stuff like that, too, which is fabulous. So, Bingo. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Well, we need to wrap this up. Um, my wife literally just said, where are you? Because you're supposed to be <laughs> So I've I, been ranting about <laughs> agriculture for <now. laughs> Yes, yes. Um, but definitely follow you, Blossom and Branch Farm on Instagram. Where else can people find you? YouTube. Uh, we've got it's same. It's Blossom and Branch on YouTube, and we are also on. Oh gosh, we're on Facebook, but we might have just gotten hacked. I don't know. You know Facebook, mm. and um, <laughs> yes, I think we're we're on TikTok very uh, hesitantly. Well, I think we have a separate phone because of that. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> Very wise. <laughs> I appreciate your time so much today. And, and hang out because we got to get the rest of this uploaded here. So, um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and hit that stop. And we'll um, thank you again so much for coming on. I really appreciate the time. Thanks for having me, Michael. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.